sorry. It wants to go full screen. Sorry, hold on one second. I don't know why I keep doing that. Well, I'll just tell you what, I'll share, for, I'll share first and then it's just not letting me see you guys so I can answer, um, you know, or kind of see who's around and who's responding. So, um, I don't know why it wants to do this, but I'll, There it goes. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. All right, so I think this is the first lecture of the year, and I think last year maybe I had luck in giving the first one too, and um, this kind of makes the most sense of just framing, um, you know, what's gonna come in the rest of it, you know, just uh, thinking about the situation as a whole. And, you know, for those of you who, I don't know how, what year you guys are, or is anyone gonna apply soon, like next year? I think so most the, of us. Okay, so, so yeah, things are really different. Um, and so I think that's probably the first thing I just wanted to talk about is, you know, there's so much online, there's a, tons of online resources and lots of things for you guys to go through and read. And sometimes I feel like I might just be regurgitating things that you, you know, that don't apply or you already know or whatever. And so I, I kind of kept a lot of the slides to go through specifically the points, but we don't really need to do that. Like, I think a lot of it is just processing through, um, you know, what your story is. And, and that's really, you know, what you're trying to get at with that, with the application. <clears throat> so um, I just wanted to start out with this quote um, that I, saw, you know, talking about how things have changed with, um, you know, the COVID landscape. And uh, this person said, I think it's important for students to understand that as the admissions committee is navigating this new landscape, we're not robots. We really do care about the work that we do and we have a good understanding and we're empathetic to the experiences that these pre-meds are having because they're not having them in isolation. They're not. It is un not unique to them and we understand that, that it's happening to everyone. So a lot of things are beyond their control and we realize that as well. And so we're just really, really relying on the holistic approach to evaluating candidates even more so than we have in the past. So that's gonna be really important. Like I think more than anything um, in my experience, COVID is just really testing our ability to adapt and to find what works and, um, and, and to continue to do the things that are important and try to not worry about the things that aren't. Um, and so um, a lot of what is coming out of, you know, the current application process is just kind of dealing with the stuff that people can't meet deadlines, like AMCAS can't meet normal deadlines and, you know, pre-med students can't get the experiences that they, that they have required in the past, that schools have required in the past. Um, and so I think in the end, we realize again as we kind of go through this it's not about checking those boxes it's about being the type of person or um, having the characteristics that will make you successful in the medical field and one of those is lifelong learning and adaptation to things that are different or difficult and so i think that that's kind of where your focus can be that you're going to make the best of you know the situation that you're in try to get as much experience and exposure as you can um, look for different ways and unique ways of doing that. Um, and remember what you're showing, what you're trying to demonstrate or what, you, what experience you're actually trying to learn um, by, you know, um, having the qualifications to go to medical school. So just let me know, just anytime, feel free to um, just kind of spit out any questions. So um, things have changed a little bit too with University of Utah they kind of changed the way that they group things but most schools kind of use this same um this same let me see if I can hide this thing 
uh, criteria, you know, it's in those same categories. And so this is kind of like that, you know, those main things, those main um, pieces of the puzzle that, that help figure, help the interviewer and the school figure out who you are. And so um, academic service, leadership, research, patient exposure, and physician, physician shadowing. And there's a lot of, like I say, a lot of um, things that help you kind of go through and understand. Now they have this anatomy of an applicant workbook. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it essentially goes through just like we've talked about where it's like, um, you know, you'll see a little bit further on that, um, that these things that you're looking at, let me just kind of roll through, what are they showing? You know what I mean? And that's exactly what it takes you through these experiences. And it helps you kind of plan out how are you going to get this experience that you need um, and become that kind of person in order to, to apply to medical school. Um, so that's on the AAMC website. So I thought this was really funny. I saw this in an article because I always kind of say that um, certain specialties kind of attract certain personalities. And so anyways, this was kind of funny. Um, talking about, you know, what kinds of people go into what kinds of fields. And so, um, you know, you take a medical student and decide if they're crazy or sane. And that kind of branches you off into these different categories. So, you know, basically, um, it's funny because it puts me in the not so much hardworking category um, and gets me down into dermatology. So I thought that was really funny because <laughs> I think it's exactly the opposite. Um, Anyways, but that's just kind of meant for some some good humor. Um, so again, for me, the application is really just to tell a story of who you are. And so that's where I kind of, you know, want, I'm looking to you for input or, or looking to you also just to kind of, um, you know, maybe you've already done this, but just process through what makes you unique and kind of like what started you out on your journey. And I thought that I would just tell you a little bit about my story so that, you know, you can kind of get an idea of how that influences what I do now. And so for me, um, my dad was a physician and I was the eight, I was the eighth of 11 kids. And um, I always say I was the oldest of the youngest. And I wanted to be a doctor from the t time I can remember. I was really close to my father and um, had a really unique relationship with him. And I always, always wanted to be a doctor. And so um, that just stayed with me forever. And I think as I moved along, it was just this part of me that kind of knew that that's what I was going to do. And I admired my father and I spent a lot of time with him in his office and kind of witnessed him talking to patients and interacting with them, people coming to the house, he was a surgeon. So people come to the house and get care and he would take care of them. You know, he would take care of us when we, when we like had an injury or whatever. And, um, and so that really influenced me. And I think also I was smart and, um, and I was curious and I liked to learn, I loved school. And, um, and so school came easy to me and learning came easy to me and, um, and that really helped me. And so I think um, the things that kind of brought me into medicine were using, using my brain, using the skills in, that I was given to be able to, you know, help other people and, and make their lives better. Um, and my mom, you know, the way that she influenced, she was the nurturer and she took care of everybody. I mean, I had 10 siblings. And so um, I learned a lot about sacrificing for the whole, you know, and how to be um, selfless from her and also just from being in this really large tribe, you know, and learned how to communicate, how to get my needs met, you know, from this big group. Um, and, and so I think that the things that I carry into medicine or like what makes me um, a good physician are that I love people and I like to interact with people and um, I, I have a personal relationship with my patients and that's really important to me. Um, one thing I learned from my dad was to help patients feel good about themselves. So he was a plastic surgeon and he met, um, with a lot of different patients, a lot of a lot of times they were coming in for things that bothered them about themselves. And he would always 
um, help them feel that they were that they were beautiful and kind of recognize those things about themselves. Um, and so that was a value that I really took to heart as well. You know, he would tell me that all the time, like, don't dye your hair, your hair's beautiful the way it is, and kind of recognizing the, the unique beauty in, in everybody. Um, and, you know, sometimes we get a really Barbie type culture um, where everybody seems like they want to look the same. And, and that was really helpful to me then and is still helpful to me now. And that's something that I pass on to my teenage patients and my female patients, you know, who are often coming to me as a dermatologist for cosmetic issues. And a word from me reassuring them that they look great, that they look um, young or they look put together or, you know, these certain things. It's these subtle things that also are just helpful to people as they are in a position to be vulnerable with you um, and be telling you things that, that put them in a vulnerable vulnerable place. And I think that's part of also making that relationship with the patient is, is becoming a peer and, and not, you know, being above them, but being a peer with them. And, and that's also really important. So I think is another different story, but that's what I bring to my patients and I bring to medicine is that I'm serious. I love learning I want to improve. I want to take good care of my patients. I really care about them personally. And so, um, and so those are the things, you know, that, that they want to understand and learn about you, your, your, your unique experiences that kind of make you who you are. And, um, and that will be different for each of you. And, um, and no one can really tell you what that is, but it's a really good experience to figure out what it is that really is driving you. So um, any questions so far? Okay, so um, again, focusing on the value of your experience. So what did something teach you? You know, I think a lot of times that's what's helpful to most people is hearing a story, you know, hearing, and you can Google and you can find, you know, good personal statements online where most of the time that's what they're, they're talking about, personal experience that really struck home to them that they were gonna, you know, that that's what made you decide, like, this is what I wanna do with my life. This is my life's purpose. And, um, and I can say that, that that's true for me, that I really did feel like this was my life's purpose. I have other, other things in my life that are important to me also, um, but this always is something that stayed with me. So <clears throat> what is, what is your community experience tell about you? It's that, that you understand how to kind of put yourself in other people's shoes and help those who need help, who are less fortunate, um, not to judge people because they are in poor circumstances or they have disease or, you know, they're different than you. You know, so I had my first um, transgender patient, which, you know, it's a little bit less common in, um, in Southern Utah, I'd say, than Southern California, where my family is, or at least openly, maybe. Um, and that was a really great experience for me. And I was glad that, you know, my derm organization sends out stuff and has kind of taught me how to approach that. And it was not, it was something that I hope the patient felt comfortable and confident in me seeing them. Um, I did get referred by another, a patient of mine who has a child who um, is transgender and helping people feel comfortable to come to you and, and get help, I think is really critical. And I think that's what those, a lot of those volunteer experiences teach you is how to, um, again, not be giving charity, but giving, you know, kindness and service um, because you're able to provide that. And, and that becomes important because also, you know, physicians a lot of times work hard and so we're, and it's stressful and it's challenging and it's, um, very risky. And so we get well, well paid, right? And so again, it's, it's staying on the level of people so that you can actually really understand and help them leadership so taking responsibility and this becomes really critical you'll you'll do this your whole life so for me this happens in, in tons of different ways you know you as a as a physician to my patients 
you know, I have to kind of lead that way. I have to give my expert opinion and um, take responsibility for this patient's condition that I did not cause, but I have to do my best to help them and kind of give them the best advice possible for them to make that decision, but yet realize that I'm not perfect and I can make mistakes. And so I try to listen to the patient carefully um, also to decide what to do about, about a given problem. Um, you'll be asked to do all kinds of stuff in the community, potentially. You have to run your, own, your practice. So even if you, you know, are, are employed and you're not the head of your business, um, you will always be, you're, you're a person who gives jobs to other people, you know, because other people are assisting you in your work. And so, um, you know, it becomes a, an opportunity for you to manage people and learn. And if you're good at that, you'll have, you'll be successful and you'll have a good practice. And that becomes important because, you know, you have to maintain this very high standard of, of, you know, making sure that patients have a good experience and making sure that errors don't get made and that sort of thing. But you also have to be compassionate and kind to your workers and to your assistants and, um, and help them kind of feel like their job matters also. And so that becomes very important part of, um, of your job of, you know, because you are the one at the end of the day, I'm the one who's responsible. Not anybody else, not my medical assistant, not my secretary, um, it's me who's responsible. Um, physician shadowing. So, you know, again, this, this just speaks to figuring out stuff, researching it before you jump in and knowing what you're getting into and have realistic expectations. Um, I think that that's the main issue there, you know, really getting experience to see, is this something I want to do or do I not want to do this? You know, there's lots of other jobs where you can help people and you can contribute to society and you can, um, and you can, um, you know, use your intellect for good or whatever, but it takes a, a, the right personality to be able to handle the stress of, you know, um, taking care of people and knowing that they might die, you know, if you A, don't get it right, or B, even if you do. And like, I had a friend who um, recently, she uh, did nothing wrong. She removed um, a mole from someone's scalp and it came back as like mildly atypical. And she told the patient to come back in three months, which was more than I would have done. And um, because, you know, that's the standard of care is like, oh yeah, you don't you know, really have to worry about that. So the patient didn't come back. She got told by her primary doctor, her hairdresser, several people to come in. It took her, I don't know, six months to come back in. And by then she had a really large, obvious melanoma on her scalp. And that was really hard for my friend who did, again, exactly what you should have done. And there was really nothing that she should have done differently. Um, but yet she still feels, you know, somewhat responsible and is, you know, had a hard time, you know, watching that patient kind of go through that. And so, um, you know, those are the kind of things that, that uh, become important for you to realize, like, is it worth it to me, uh, uh, you know, to do that? Is that, is that too hard? And, and there's, there's job pressures in other areas, you know, I mean, there's other jobs with lots of pressure, um, but the, the margin of error with people is a little bit harder. That being said, patients are very understanding that you're a person and not a computer, and they um, understand that you're giving opinions and um, and usually are very compassionate <clears throat> with us as as we just do our best, you know. Um, with um, patient exposure, again, I think it's just coming into contact with people and and seeing what that interaction is like, you know, and um, whether or not it's something you enjoy um, and are really driven towards. And I think you'll, you know, that's something you figured out, but how do you show that? What story do you tell about a patient that impacted you or demonstrates, you know, something about your story or your experience? Um, and, you know, those are the kind of things that they're looking for of like rounding out your own um 
your own story, you know, helping you on that way or confirming your decisions as you move forward. Um, with research, that's kind of going along with um, academics, but just being a lifelong learner, having questions, you know, seeing something in, unique about a patient and contacting. It's really fun now for me, like I'm in these Facebook groups, um, which is new to to me like I don't I, I'm not on Facebook I don't have time for that right like I got four kids and I work so um but now it's helpful to me because it's a big forum like across the nation of other dermatologists that experience things and so people will post you know they'll be like have you ever seen this um you know or I had this experience uh you know is anyone having seen this also or you know even with COVID you know kind of like sharing this pooled um, information and um, and that's what pushes our specialty forward or, or people asking questions and wanting to get to the answers and um, and asking questions when when things happen that we don't expect so like you've seen how like things change right and and recommendations from the medical community change and that's because again physicians don't you know they don't they're a little bit on the independent side, right? And they and they don't always accept what everybody tells them and they see what they observe. And so we're good at that, right? So, you know, when someone's, you know, we thought, oh, smoking is okay, what's wrong with that? And then, you know, you observe so many people having cancer and you say, well, they were all smokers. That's, you know, interesting. And then, and then that's what moves specialty forward, you know, tanning beds, that's my specialty. You know, all of a sudden we see tons of teenagers with melanoma. What's changed? What is it? You know, oh, it's tanning beds. And now we, that's, that's a really important part of, of medicine as well. And then academics, you know, taking full loads, showing that you're, um, that you can handle it. Medical schools, just a lot. You, you, can train for a lifetime and and you know not know everything you know and so you just have to be able to handle that load so those are kind of the things that um that they're looking for to understand about you and make sure that this is a good fit for you um they're both both as their school you know what their philosophy is why they're um why they're might be you would fit in there, you know, or make a difference. And that's another thing to bring up is like, okay, is, does their mission go along with what you're trying to do? And also what will you bring to the table at that school? So, you know, um, I kind of always say like in Utah, you know, there were, I don't know, now it's be, be, being a lot more diverse, but you know, when I was in school, it was like, in my class there were 75% males and 25% females. And when I served on the, on the um, application committee, I got lots of white male Mormon missionary applications, you know? And so I just say, sometimes that may not make you diverse in Utah, but that may make you diverse in, you know, Alabama. Um, and, so, and so that's also part of it is, is it's not so much that, that, um, it, you know, it, it's just that we need, if you're going to be a well-rounded physician, a well-rounded trained physician, you need exposure to that. And you need exposure to people who have other experiences than you do, um, or at least it's very helpful, you know? And so, and so I think that's part of it too, is, um, is what can you bring? And also what can that school help you accomplish? What, what are you trying to do? So um, the, these just kind of go to links of uh, the core competencies, again, it kind of goes into de even more detail, literally every little thing that they are looking for. Um, and, and so you just go to those and you pick out, what am I good at? What makes me um, a good applicant? What experiences have I had? What's driving me to do this? You know, asking those questions. And then just remembering there, there is a physician shortage in the United States. They've, they've confirmed it again. I talked about this last year. I looked it up again. They still know that that's coming. They're trying to add more residency positions. They know that, you know, there, there can be these, um, these uh, areas of, and people, especially who have limited access to good health care, and that that's an important part of, uh, of, of medicine. You know, so in, in our generation, it's Medicare and Medicaid. Um, in my dad's generation, there were um, 
you know, and they, they do have this now, but um, back then it was a mandate that, that there were these hospitals where you would go work and volunteer a certain amount of days um, to provide care to people who, who couldn't afford care. And so, you know, that's part of that altruism of medicine, of, of volunteering your skills of, a, of something that's necessary and needed, even when people can't pay. And I, and I think that's just part of, part of um, who we are as a specialty. So we've talked a lot about this, but um, trying to stand out in a few areas, you don't have to stand out in every, but pick those areas where you're particularly strong and that sets you apart and makes you unique. Um, you know, be confident about your experiences, but also recognizing that you, there are things that you need to learn that you need, um, you know, to experience. Um, and then also just being true to yourself, um, giving them, you know, uh, pieces of, of the puzzle so that they can put that puzzle together to figure out who you are and, and why you would be a good, a good, um, both medical student and, and physician. So um, any questions? I feel like I would learn more if you guys, <laughs> if I could hear your story. So there are some questions in the chat, but I was just thinking that we could save all of the questions for the end. Is that okay with you? I'll be fine. Okay. I stay on time. Um, so this is just kind of going through application timeline. This is Utah's, you know, obviously every school is different and, but they have really great, you know, stuff that's posted now that you can kind of follow. All this is different with COVID. And so you know, it's posted all over the, um, the um, AAMC website and easy to track down, but just things to keep in mind. Always start early, um, you know, for University of Utah, particularly they do rolling admissions. Not everybody does, but they do. And so they're, they, you can start putting an application as early as June 1st. Um, they're already sending out secondary applications and doing interviews, and they're, they're already starting to admit people, regular decision by October 15th. So just because you don't, you know, you may apply early and get accepted, you know, doesn't necessarily mean they're always kind of keeping spots open, but it's helpful sometimes don't rush your application and make sure it's a good application. That's the most important thing because, they're, you know, again, they're always kind of accepting people. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, sometimes if you can get it in and be a little bit earlier, you know, then you're kind of in that process and you know, you know, where you got, want to go. The difference is though, you know, sometimes, um, you might be waiting for another school or you might get a delayed acceptance, but people know that, you know, and that's always kind of part of the thing is you accept one, but you have time and that's why there's wait lists and other things, you know. Um, and so, you know, just kind of keeping that timeline in mind, I borrowed this from one of the websites, but just seeing, you know, this is, this is very typical, you know, but these are kind of the, the main times where they, you know, everyone says, you know, do it early if you can but you, you can do it, you know, up to these dates and make sure that you do a good job of it first. Um, I, you know, AMCAS is pretty straightforward. Everybody usually knows all of this. So I really just run through this quick, but you know, this is used by everybody except for usually Texas. There's maybe like one other school that's not um, all these different sections. So in the lecture series, they'll co cover each of these in detail. Um, but some, these are just a few things that helped me having hard copies of your stuff. So it's easy to fill out very carefully your application. Um, you know, having as many people as possible read things and, and for typos, because it's just about showing that you, that you're uh, paying attention, that you go above and beyond in everything you do. And, and that's just part of who, who physicians are, you know, um, it's funny because when you are a medical student or a pre-med, you don't realize that you're kind of like, Oh, everybody could do this, you know, but not everybody can do it. And, um, people appreciate that, you know, and so you may not appreciate that about yourselves, but, um, but that is just, you know, kind of how, how that specialty is. And you really do have to be willing to go the extra mile for people. Um, and you know, this is kind of one of those careers where you're the, pinnacle of, of, you know, of higher education. And um, so, man, I'm sorry, I'm a grammar Nazi. Um, that's how I am. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's just showing, you know, that you go above and beyond. 
So letters of recommendation, just really quickly, they'll go through this in detail. Um, the U, you, you know, they, they say at least three uh, provide four. I often tell you to, you know, make those relationships and ask them to write letters right then, you know, um, when you when they know you best and they can always update it. I mean, oftentimes they want you to have current letters um, and they want you to have current experiences, but at least you know that you have these core people when you really have a relationship with someone. It's something that you probably will end up con continuing and having them mentor you. And, um, and those are the best people to write. They, the ones that you connect with, that get you. And I always talk about my main professor in college and he, that was how he was. And um, I was a physics major and I don't know how I, I ended up in physics. Um, I always joke that I was a non-science science major. But um, I had this professor who really cared about me and knew I wanted to go to med school. And it was a long major and I, you know, went to, I went on a study abroad and I, you know, did all my pre-med classes and whatever. And so I wasn't going to quite be able to graduate on time. And he looked at it with me and he figured it out. And he was like, well, you should do applied physics, you know? And then I graduated and um, I wasn't going to walk in my graduation because my brother graduated the same year as I did. And so his graduate, you know, I'm one, of, I'm eight of 11. And so his graduation was before mine. So my parents were like, well, you can just walk with him, you know? And my, Professor was like, so, you know, my program was very small. And so he, that was really important to him. He was like really proud of me. Um, and, and I had this real sense of accomplishment that he kind of gave to me. And so he dressed up in his robes and he came to that. I like could cry about it. He came to that other graduation where I was so that he could deliver me my diploma. And he was one of those that wrote one of my letters, you know, because we just developed that kind of relationship and he understood me and my goals and who I was. And he was able to, you know, really communicate that. And that's really who you're looking for. Those people that have a personal connection with you that have really, you know, mentored you and, and want to help you. And if you don't have that, you need to find that. And, um, and I think that that's critical and that's how medicine works also. So you have these mentors when you go through school. I have these mentors, you know, that I had who really helped me that I still keep in contact with. And that's something that I continue to do, you know, with the people that I come into contact with because, you know, that is just how we pass down and, and help each other, you know, and, and, and bring people in to, to this kind of great, you know, career of medicine and, and, you know, pass it forward. You know, that was in medicine a long time before it was, you know, paying it forward was around a long time before. Um, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, then med school. So, so I think I put in here, but uh, 16 is about the average and everybody's a little bit different. So, you know, my husband can tell you a funny story about that and remind him to tell you uh, about his, but in any case, you know, you do just have to kind of make sure you got all those things and make sure you meet that. Don't waste your 50 bucks or whatever applying for a school that you don't have the right class for um, and that you would actually go there, you know, so that that's important. Um, and then uh, secondary applications. So this is important. You know, again, make sure you meet those requirements. Um, I think I looked this up again. They didn't give me a year, so this is the one, but I looked it up again on, on M, uh, AMC and they said the same thing. Um, have, you know, 50 of your, 50% um, should be attainable. And then, you know, if you wanna have some outlier schools, especially schools where you feel like you can bring um, something diverse to that school. Um, finances may play a role into that. So that's why, you know, it used to be more. I mean, in-state tuition in Utah was amazingly cheap um, compared to most other schools. And I think things are kind of leveling out a little bit, but, you know, by and large, if you go to a private school rather than a state school, it's going to be expensive, you know, and out-of-state schools the same, um, you know, paying out-of-state tuition and that sort of thing. So that's something to keep in mind. But a lot of those schools also do sometimes have really good um, financial aid and they can help you do that. And... Um, but it is something you just want to think about um, because sometimes people get into huge amounts of debt 
Um, and that can be killer, you know, to just have, be having to pay that off. Um, so anyways, you kind of, all this is stuff you know. Um, I'm just gonna really quickly go over secondary applications. So you'll get um, from each school as you go through the AMCAS and they put that in, then you'll get a secondary application before you get invited for interviews. And so um, you're gonna get this reapplication that you gotta fill out. It's kind of crazy. You're like, really, don't you have all my information? Um, but the other thing that you can do to prepare, and sometimes they'll even list them on their website now, which is super useful, um, but be prepared for the questions because you have to return your applications within 30 days usually. And you've like spent six months working on your AMCAS application, then all of a sudden you're supposed to like throw this thing together in 30 days. And so that's why you want to do a lot of research on the schools beforehand, because by and large, their questions are, why do you, why do you want to come to our school? What's going to make you diverse in our school? And what do you, what, you know, what are you going to do? Like, what does your life look like in 10 to 15 years? You know, um, describe a personal challenge and how you overcame it. Um, you know, you can reuse things, but just be careful when you recycle um, because it will rule you out if you have a, the wrong school's name on that essay. <laughs> They'll be like, well, uh, that's, that's an oversight. Um, you know, they might ask you what fields of medicine interest you, what challenges do you see? Um, and so these are the questions that I would just kind of almost throw out to, to you at the, you know, kind of as we approach the end of what, what I can answer for you, um, some of these questions. Um, and then like, here's, here's, for example, I think this is your University of Alabama um, that's saying, you know, kind of the same thing. Um, you know, any information you want us to know that we haven't asked you already, um, how you would add diversity, how COVID-19 has affected you. And as you may know, that's also another question now, in addition to the, um, in addition to the personal statement um, is how COVID has affected you so that you can use your personal statement for non-COVID stuff, you know. Um, describe a patient interaction and how it affected you, service experience. Um, there are just a couple things. Um, you can apply as a disadvantaged uh, candidate and there's stuff about that, um, but they also do track, you know, your parents' kind of socioeconomic status and um, there was another one that kind of just is in your, it is kind of in your application that they don't really tell you necessarily that it's helping, but that's part of that kind of like whole holistic idea about interviews because everybody knows numbers don't really help you, right? And so that's really always what they're trying to get at is who is the person, you know, and, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, one quick thing about social media, I'm sure you guys totally know this because like, you know this more than my generation ever could. I totally respect you guys because I can only imagine what it's like. Um, but again, you know, these are things to think about. Like, you know, keep your accounts private, you know, because they'll look you up and they'll kind of see what kind of person you really are on your in your free time, you know. It's not like people are the police, but it's an easy thing to look into, you know, and be like, well, what what is this person not telling me, you know, that might be important to their success? And it may not be, but it's those things, you know, the warning things that you, that you might look for. And so it's just something to keep in mind, you know. Um, I think also that's just how you, you have to look at yourself as a physician because that's how it is later. You know, you're going to represent a different level of, you know, open. You need, you need to be more open, more understanding, more generous, more, you know, anything because because otherwise it's, it's hard for people to be vulnerable with you, you know? Um, and so, and so that becomes important for people to feel comfortable and, and confident um, in your care. Um, this is University of Utah basic requirements. So the only thing different that's going on, so they, they kind of creep up, you know, it used to be a little bit lower, now it's 500 um, and 510. But again, you know, these are, these are, we know this already, you know, but that's not, the cutoffs are the most important thing because really, again, it's who you are. But most of the candidates are just that top tier candidate. That's how people come in. 
Um, these have changed. So now they call this community engagement and they don't have minimums. So this year they don't, they might next year, you know, um, so keep that in mind. But for right now, they kind of have waived that and they just call it community engagement. Um, same thing with clinical experience. They, they group it all together now and there's no minimums. Um, but there are good ways for you to get experience. Like I was working in New Hampshire um, a couple weeks ago and it was, it was the weirdest thing. Like, so, so in dermatology specifically, they have medical scribes because we move very quickly. There's lots of information, you know, something that we do often. So anyways, I took on a poll with an iPad, a medical scribe that was in California that's uh, pre-med and rolled her on into the room and she took the note for me while I did my stuff and told her what I was doing and like dictated to her. Um, and that was, you know, that's direct patient care. Um, that's considered direct patient care. So there are these unique um, experiences that you can have in the COVID era, you know, and, and I think um, those are, those are good, helpful experiences. Um, and then intellectual curiosity. So that's now what they're calling research. Um, and just showing again that you're intellectually curious because, because again, if they make these requirements that are like, well, you have to do, you know, hypothesis based research, you know, and then you're getting people who kind of have to do this and check off this box, but it really isn't contributing to what they're doing, you know, to who they are, what they're doing. Like, I mean, they're, again, they want the well rounded person. Uh, um, and you do have to understand research, you know, because this is how we do what we do, you know, I mean, when I talk to my friends, that's the conversation I have because they don't get it. They're like, well, what's the difference with you and the holistic doctor down the road? And I'm like, well, you know, may not be perfect, but we do medical trials, you know, to actually have and show that something is effective so that I know in this patient population, typically, you know, in studies, it says that it's 75% effective for, you know, this topical treatment is 75% effective for the treatment of squamous cell carcinoma, uh, inside to you. And, you know, so we can talk about options and we can say, Hey, in this circumstance, you could do this or this. That's what we do. And people don't under even understand that sometimes, you know, that's what we do. So that's why you have to understand research. You have to understand how, how we're using data to, you know, support what we do. You know, there is a lot of art to medicine, but there also is a lot of science too. <laughs> um, and then I always throw this in there cause it's a little bit over the top, you know, uh, just because I just always say, like, it's a little bit crazy. I mean, you could go crazy and, you know, do tons and tons and tons of hours, but, you know, at least meet your minimums and stick out in the areas where you stick out. And that's probably the best um, advice I could give you. Okay, guys, hopefully I left enough time of um, giving you lots of question time. It looks like there's quite a bit of time. So we'll start with the first one. It was Dresden Quackenbush. He asked, was there ever a point in your career so far that you regretted being a doctor even for a second? So I think for me personally, one of the hardest times has been um, kind of going through that feeling of, of not being able to be perfect and making errors, you know, and, and, and kind of getting comfortable with the fact that I'm going to screw up and that that's okay. And I think that that was probably one of the hardest things um, to accept for me in, in medicine because I care. I care about my patients. I care about people. I see a lot of my neighbors and, you know, my neighbor's kids and, you know, you don't want to screw it up. I mean, you don't want to hurt people. You know, that's our first rule, do no harm. You know, so I think for me, um, that that's mostly been it is, is, you know, getting, just finally getting comfortable with that and saying, you know, um, I'm gonna, it's okay. You know, like I can't, I can't expect to get it right 100% of the time and patients don't expect me to do that. And I have to be honest um, with when I'm, you know, with what my level of expertise is and then my experience level, but also always open it up to the patient of saying, this is my clinical opinion today with experience that I have. Um, but I listen to you and I say, how, how much is this, how much are you worried about this? Um, you know, whatever, and we kind of make a joint decision. And so I'd say that's, um, that's probably the main thing. Other than that, I, I really, really love my job, you know, and, and I say, I'm over that now. Like, every once in a while, you know, you have those experiences where you're like, oh, it's so stressful. 
Um, but, but overall, I, I really, I love my job. All right. And then the next question was kind of asked twice. So how and when did you decide to become a dermatologist? So for me, it was later, you know, I sh maybe should have known it sooner. My dad was a plastic surgeon and he um, kind of talked to me about it early on. And um, I knew I didn't, I just wasn't a surgery personality. Um, you know, you have to kind of be really, really sure of yourself. I would have had a hard time operating on people and not, not having good outcomes, you know, um, and uh, that sort of thing. So, so that just wasn't a good field for me. But for me, I really thought I would be primary care because um, I saw, you know, these relationships with people and that was really important to me. Like I knew I wanted to see old people and young people and kids and, you know, kind of have that um, experience. And, and then I realized like, oh my gosh, family practice is like overwhelming. So I thought a lot about um, med peds, you know, so I could kind of like specialize, but still kind of get that co combination. And, and it wasn't until like I hit third year and started rotating, I, I came across um, my, uh, my first intern in surgery was a dermatology resident. And he really got me interested in the field of dermatology. It was just like, so like, it's the best. You need to learn about it, you know? And I did my first like project in it. And, and, um, and it, just, it just like fit my personality, kind of fit who I was. And you, you kind of find your tribe, you know, a lot of times in those, in those different specialties. So for me, it was third year um, where I really, third year medical school, where I really knew. So sometimes you think you're going in, you're like, oh, I think I'll like this, you know, but um, you know, my buddy, he thought he was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. And then, you know, he did dermatology and he was like, I really like this. I don't know. You know, so I, I got to, you know, grab him and be like, this is awesome. You got to do this, you know? And so anyways, there's other orthopedic surgeons that was like, oh, derm, so boring, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, you, you might think, you know, but until you really get in there, sometimes it's hard to know. What was the most difficult point of your journey to becoming a physician? Um, for me, you know, things uh, worked out for me pretty well up until derm residency. So derm residency is really competitive. And I, um, I didn't really, like I say, you kind of have to know early on or like really keep your options open if you're going to do something um, really hard to get into sometimes. And so, you know, I was a good student, but I, I, you know, was not an AOA candidate and I, that wasn't like my goal in medical school, you know, I did a lot of other things. And, um, and so, you know, when I hit dermatology and I realized like, oh my gosh, I got to apply in dermatology residency. I used to joke like, oh my gosh, I'm going to end up like doing derm in Iowa, which to me, like, I didn't know anything about Iowa. I, I mean, the middle of the country, like, yeah, I just don't know any appeal to it, you know, and come to find out Iowa is like a really awesome dermatology residency. <laughs> Anyways, but, um, but that was kind of the, the first time where I didn't, um, I didn't get what I wanted right away, you know, and I didn't get into derm residency um, the first time I applied and I ended up doing a research year, which was a, such an awesome experience for me. I did a research fellowship in melanoma um, and reapplied and was able to get in after that. So that was probably one of the biggest challenges for me. Um, and you'll experience those things. And actually when you apply to derm residency, that's a common question they ask you like, um, have you ever failed at anything in your life? You know, because, because it is like just this really competitive, you know, group of people for whatever reason. Um, a lot of perfectionist personalities. <laughs> what does that say about me? You know, but um, I, I think that that was probably the hardest. And, and luckily I had really strong mentors that helped me. And, um, and I just was like, this is what I want to do, you know, and I stayed really committed to that. And, um, felt really driven in that in that career, and I, I think that's what helped me kind of continue that journey. But that doesn't always happen, and sometimes I think, you know, that was a question oftentimes that they would ask too, like, well, what if you don't get in? What are you going to do? You know, and I had never considered that. I didn't even realize that, you know. And I think um, I, I think that that's important, you know. To they'll ask you that in med school, you know, they'll ask you that in your interviews, like, what will you do if you don't get into med school? That was a hard question for me. I'm like reapply <laughs> like, this is it this is what i want to do so all right and then the next question is how have you made adjustments in your own practice since the covid19 pa pandemic 
Do you see telemedicine becoming more commonplace for outpatient specialties? And how do you imagine that will impact medical education? That's a great question. That's a, that's a good, I'm sure that's a good question. Um, for me, uh, it, it really has changed a lot. It's hard for me because um, I'm someone who, I interact a ton with my patients. Like, I, I probably hug all my patients. I mean, because they're just my friends. Like, they know about my crazy kids and my life and blah, blah, blah. And they followed me around to these different practices that I've been at for 10 years. And, um, and you know, we just have these relationships. So for me, it was really hard. It was really hard for me, like, not to hug my patients, um, you know, and to mask up, like, seeing new patients it's really hard uh, to feel like you know somebody and they take off their mask for a minute and I see their face, but it, it's, it's a difficult interaction and I hope, I hope, hope, hope we don't have to do this forever. But yes, I, telemedicine, I think it's good. Like I think that um, there are a lot of things that can go that way. It lends a lot of flexibility also to, um, to uh, medicine and to people's lives. You know, people want um, convenience and, and have it to be easier, you know, for them to get the care they need. And um, in Durham, you know, there's certain things that you've got to see in person. You, you really can't, but there's a lot of things that you can do and follow-ups that you can do and advice you can give. Um, and so I do, I, th I think that that will continue to be something that we use. Um, you know, for example, uh, pathology. I work for a company where that's, that does digital pathology. And um, now they're not reliant on the glass slide and they scan in the glass slide and you use like a virtual microscope to um, look at those pictures. So that will become a lot like radiology where you probably just can read from wherever you are, um, you know, remote, uh, you know, remote opportunities in medicine. And, and I think that's really great. All right, and the next question was, what do you think is the most valuable to enter into medical schools? Getting a master or taking a year off to do some research? Oh, I think either one is super valuable. I think it has to do with your path, you know, and what your ultimate goal is and who and what's driving you. Um, because any of those extra experiences that you can bring, again, just make you a little bit different from you give you a little bit different perspective. So like one of my friends didn't get in one year and he went and got his master's in public health. And he is like, he's interesting. He's, a, he's an orthopedic surgeon now, but he is like very, like almost kind of an anti-surgeon. You know, He's like very holistic and he's very careful in his approach. I mean, it really probably changed a lot how he, how he purchased medicine. And I think that diversity is really good and, and um, having people who, you know, we'll look at things a little bit differently. You know, he's really into um, lifestyle choices and spends a lot of time educating his patients in that way, you know. So I think that it really just, I think more, more than anything, it's like, where do you feel driven? And um, then bringing that experience and showing what it did for you or how it might have changed or how it changed your perspective on, you know, your, your goals or, your, um, or where you're headed long term. All right, and the next one is, do you think that doing minors or double majors will help or does it not make much of a difference? I think it, I think it can, you know, because again, that's, people have respect for that, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's um, it's, you're probably carrying heavy loads, you know, you probably, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, kind of having two different really diverse majors, you know, it's just giving you a little bit more experience. So yeah, I think those academic things, um, can, can help, you know, again, if academics is really one of your strong suits, that's something that you can, um, use to say, you know what, I love learning and I couldn't decide what I liked better, you know? And so I wanted to do both because, you know, I just, you know, whatever, whatever it says about you, it, it's more about what it says about you and your personality. Um, and, and, and again, what makes you different that way and, and how does it make you better? a better student or a better um, medical student or a better doctor long-term, like how does that fit in your plan? You know, so like if you're a double major with Spanish, like, well, yeah, that's freaking awesome, you know, because um, that's gonna be a skill that you bring, you know, I, I speak Spanish and, and it's so great to be able to converse with people and help a more diverse population because I speak it, I speak a different language. So, you know, it's fun. I went, I got to go to, um, 
uh, Guatemala and do and do a medical mission down there and communicate directly with patients and you know it was it was really great so yeah those things can be really helpful all right and the next one was a more specific question asking if volunteer hours in the emergency room can count as patient exposure hours I believe so if you're directly involved with patient care. So like, I think when you're indirect, it's kind of like if you're cleaning up or if you're, you know, like, but if you have, if your job is caring for the patient in some way, then absolutely, I think that's true. All right, and how do you recommend med school applicants get patient exposure? Um, so I mentioned the, um, the, sh the scribing, you know, so looking for kind of other ways to interact that you wouldn't normally. Um, you know, obviously there's always the jobs of being an orderly. So I know lots of med students who were orderlies in the hospital or a CNA or a medical assistant. So like my niece was my medical assistant for probably six months um, in dermatology because she, you know, wants to go to medical school and got exposure that way. Um, you know, so there, it's harder you know, it's going to be harder with COVID. Um, but I think that's, there are enough volunteer experiences where you can do that and, and get online. There's lots of resources. Like I was looking at AMC website um, before that and, and they, and they kind of list it out for you. And they're like, Hey, here's some ways that you can, can look into getting, getting more of these experiences and or your medical school, um, you know, that you of choice, you know, that you're wanting to go to, um, all can kind of give you ideas in that way. All right, and I know Intermountain isn't allowing shadowing right now, but one of our students wants to know if you'd be open to some of the Dixie State students shadowing you. Absolutely, I'm always open to that, and I think I think it's really I think that's really important. And I don't know what the rule is with with private offices. Um, I'll have to ask my office like what they're what they're doing. Um, you know, most of my patients are pretty liberal, and they just you know they they wear the the mask because they have to but they're almost more bugged by it than I am half the time <laughs> so so um so hopefully that will that will happen for you guys and and even if you know I, there's always just opportunities um you know or if you want to have a conversation and figure out something a little bit different you know um I, I think you'll find those opportunities and what do you think is the best way to ask a physician a physician if you can shadow them um I would just let them know, you know, this is a requirement for medical school. I'm really interested in your specialty. You know, I'd like to get exposure. I'd like, you know, I'd like to, you know, even, even say like, um, can I ask you some questions about your specialty and, uh, and interact with them in a little, in a little way um, so that they can kind of develop that, that trust with you to see, oh yeah, they're a good student. They're a serious student. They, you know, they have genuine interest in this. Um, most doctors, like they say, it's just part of the job you know, mentoring is just part of it. And so most of us are pretty open to that. If we can do it, you know, um, most of us are pretty open to that. All right, and do you prefer working in a private practice or a large hospital setting? Um, for me, I had, I did it kind of a little bit of both ways and I think there are advantages to both. Um, and in general though, a lot of people are, you, for a while in dermatology at least, a lot of people were kind of joining these big groups, these private equity groups and stuff. And then you realize like how much people are dictating to you how to practice. And so you lose some autonomy when you kind of join a large organization. Um, and so if it just depends on your personality, like how much you want to be told how to do things. And most doctors don't love that. <laughs> Um, you know, so, so, but anywhere you go, there's a little bit of politic, but in general, private practice, just, you, you know, these days it becomes a lot easier to manage a practice. Cause I think for a while people are like, oh, there's all these government regulations. It's really scary to kind of try to run my own and do, but like right now, for example, there's a derm startup group, um, for, you know, only dermatologists and, um, they just talk back and forth about like, how do you do this? And how do you do this? And how do you do this? And so there's so much information sharing now that I think people are a lot less intimidated uh, by managing their practices and realizing it's really not that hard. And, um, you know, you, you, you give up a lot of your reimbursement um, to let somebody else manage you. And, um, and uh, so I think, I think it's, 
it's a mix. It also depends on your specialty because some specialties really they'll just do better in a hospital setting. Um, and you know the hospital also has really broad insurance coverage and that sort of thing. And so uh, sometimes that really matters. Uh, for me, I'd say I had a really I had a pretty good experience, um, except for the fact that I think the reimbursement is is probably the biggest difference. I had a lot of autonomy in my practice to, to try to decide how to do how I wanted to do things, even in a hospital setting or kind of like that, you know, multi specialty group. Um, but I sacrificed a lot of reimbursement for that. All right. And then would you be willing to share your email with us so that some students can go ahead and email you about shadowing? Absolutely. So it's pretty easy. It's just April is my first name dot a dot Larson. So I'm L A R S O N at gmail.com. Yeah. And feel free anytime you guys, I'd love to help out in any way I can. I, I, I love, I love seeing your faces and you know, <laughs> just uh, seeing, seeing you guys go through this and remembering what that was like. And I, I would be happy to help you out in any way I can. And what do you think about virtual shadowing? I think it can be great. Like I say, um, I just, I had that little experience with my little friend on a pole. And at first I was like, this is super weird. And then by the first patient, I was like, oh, this is actually pretty cool, you know? And the patients even felt like that. Like, it was just funny. It was like, I like bring her in on this pole, like introducing her like, here, this is Nicole. And she's gonna scribe for me today. But it was great. And she was actually awesome. Like she was probably the best scribe that I worked with. Um, when I was there, you know, so I think it's, I think still you can get that experience and, and that's just part of the world that we live in now, you know, look, look at us on this zoom call, right? Like before I started my other job, um, I literally like did not know how to do a Google hangout or had like been on a zoom call like once, you know, like it's just like not part of my life. And now, I mean, I do it every day, you know? So I think there's a lot of advantage to it too, because Again, it's just, you know, even though you're not there personally, sometimes you can even seeing faces is really helpful compared to like how I have to interact with patients now, so. All right, and it looks like we're out of time. Did you wanna keep taking questions or are you? Totally up to you guys. I have time, so, you know, it's, it's really you guys that have to go study and like you need it, you need to have a, part-time your part-time job is applying to medical school oh my gosh it's like so complicated <laughs> i have one question myself so as a dermatologist how closely do you work with oncologists and how often do the fields cross over um you know pretty often um that's probably almost the specialty i work with more than any here so um you know a lot of a lot of times it's dermatology and rheumatology that cross but my patient population you know you just have patients who um, I, I have either cancer or other kind of interesting diseases that need, um, that need treatment. So Derek Haslam, who, who I know from med school and, um, you know, is on my, is on my speed. I'll probably talk to him more about patients than, than any specialty. So it's interesting. I mean, I say, I don't know how common that is, but it is a specialty that I interact with quite a bit. All right. Yeah, he's actually presenting for us next week. I'm not sure the exact topic, but he'll be a lot more fun than me. <laughs> I'm a little bit more in the steer. <laughs> you guys are all great. Thanks. Well, please always give us feedback. You know, like if there's things that we can talk about that are more useful, if you're like, hey, I didn't need to hear about this at all, like please let us know because it's hard for me sometimes to know, you know whether it's helpful or not helpful or whatever. So you guys let us know how, how we can improve too. Got it. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'd like to give you a big thank you from all of us. You're so welcome. Thanks so much for asking me. All right, any other questions before I end the meeting, guys? My daughter thinks she wants to be a trauma surgeon. She's 15. <laughs> So yeah, I might be uh, emailing you guys in a few years like, oh, <laughs> <you>. <laughs> thanks again, you guys. You're awesome. Good luck with everything. Thank you.